everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about the BYU Jerusalem Center. And, uh, you know, there there's talk about whether this could be turned into a temple. Uh, at least there has been for a while. Um, I've heard that it's been debunked, but uh, I haven't found anything that has debunked it so far. So uh, we're going to be talking about this. And there's a lot of interesting things to the BYU Jerusalem Center. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you end up liking it, hit the notification bell, leave your comments, especially if you have additional information about this or uh, anything that uh, debunks this idea, because I would love to look that over. Um, I, I searched for it, and I couldn't find anything that debunked the idea that this could be converted into a temple. Now, um, I think a lot of people do believe that uh, the third temple that will be built by the Jews, or that they're trying to build anyway, will be the temple that needs to be built before Christ comes for the second coming. Well, an alternate theory is that the BYU Jerusalem Center at some point could be uh, converted into a temple, and that this would be uh, the new temple of Jerusalem. Now, um, I know that there's some people that don't like that idea, um, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. If that's what happens, then that's what happens. Um, I'm not sure what I think, but I'm not going to discount this, okay? Because I could see it happening either way. So uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, just right off the bat, is this. We're, we're coming back to this quote from Joseph Smith. Uh, he says, Judah must return. Jerusalem must be rebuilt. Uh, those two things have already occurred, right? And the temple, <clears throat> okay, so as far as we know, the temple hasn't been built yet unless um, the BYU Jerusalem Center will become a temple uh, later on. Anyway, but here, here's the thing right here. And water come out from under the, t the temple and the waters of the Dead Sea be healed. Okay, so <clears throat> that might be something that kills it, but, but maybe not, okay? Um, I pulled up this map right here. Nope. Right here. Um, all these um, markers right here, these red markers, these are all springs. So as you can see, around Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem, it's just like nothing but springs. And then here's the Dead Sea over here. Now, uh, the BYU Jerusalem Center... Well, let me see if I can find it. So I'm going to switch this over to satellite view where, where'd it go why can't i do that okay whatever so <clears throat> basically here's the here's the western wall here's the right here th this is the temple mount right here okay you have the gihon spring pool of shalom this down here and the byu jerusalem center is basically kind of like up over here by uh hebrew university jerusalem it's like kind of like in this area and um, i have another map we'll, we'll get into that later but we do know that the earth is going to change when christ comes uh, we also know that there's going to be a great earthquake specifically related to the siege on jerusalem we've read about that um so things could change as far as like locations of springs and where water can come out. So who knows? Maybe maybe it's possible that water might come out from underneath uh, what's currently the BYU Jerusalem Center and then flow over here to uh, the Dead Sea. So I'm not going to say that it's outside the realm of possibilities, especially when you have all these springs just like all over the place in Jerusalem, right? Okay, so <clears throat> if you're not aware... There has been a lot that's gone in to, to making this building. Um, a lot of miracles. Literally, there have been miracles that have taken place that has that uh, paved the way for, for the church to construct this center. And um, as you're about to see, we're going to go through some of the stories. And um, <clears throat> you're going to see that the church went to uh, great lengths to build this. Okay. Um, there's a lot to it. I don't think, you know, th this is why I have to entertain the idea that this could be the future temple, because there's so many miracles that are associated with it, and the church went through such trouble and effort to build this, right? And for what? Just to be like a separate uh, student center or a study center for Near East Studies? 
I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I'm not, you know, uh, whether it becomes a temple or not, there's probably more to this building than just being uh, a campus in Jerusalem. Okay. And, and you're about to see, you're about to see if, some of these stories. Maybe, you know, maybe some of them you don't. Um, but let's just get into some of the information here. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the Wikipedia article about it. <clears throat> okay. Plans to build a center for students were announced by LDS Church President uh, Spencer W. Kimball in 1979. So relatively speaking, relative to um, when this dispensation started, this is kind of a more recent development. Okay. By 1984, the church had obtained a 49-year lease on the land and had begun construction. Okay, so this 49-year lease, and this is a renewable lease, okay? I, I don't know what the conditions are in order to renew it. I'm sure that it would probably just renew. Um, but one interesting thing about this, this 49-year lease, is that from 1984, uh, 49 years later is 2000. 33. <laughs> it's 2033. Um, now, we know that the, the Gregorian calendar is off. It's probably not exactly in line with, with when Christ was born and so on and so forth. But that being so, you still get the, the number 33 um, from this lease end date, right? If Christ comes, like it'd be interesting if he came in 2033. Uh, even though it may not be exactly 2,000 years from the time that he was crucified, that number would be in our minds. And and I think that the Lord does do things, even though, you know, we used to be on the lunar calendar back in Old Testament and New Testament times. Um, I think the Lord, he works within the systems that we're using uh, so that we can understand. Um, so anyway, that's, that's just a thought. Okay. All right, let's continue. Okay, the center's prominent uh, position on on the Jerusalem skyline quickly brought it <clears throat> brought it notice by the ultra orthodox Jews or Haredim of Israel. Uh, protests and opposition to the building of the center springing up from the Haredim made the issuing of um, made the issue of building the center a national and even international issue. Okay, so this caused quite the stir. Let's go over here. I have, um, we've looked at this 360 um, <clears throat> image before when we were talking about uh, the Golden Gate right here, right? This is the Eastern wall of the Temple Mount. And uh, this is the gate that tradition holds that Christ uh, is gonna go through uh, during once he comes to the Mount of Olives that he'll go through here. And I'm not talking about LDS tradition. I'm talking about just like Christian tradition that he'll uh, go through here. Uh, this will become unsealed and he'll go to the temple. Uh, and the Jews believe that this is where their Messiah will come through and go to the temple. Now, if you look over here, you know, right, right across, uh, here's the Mount of Olives, right? Um, and we know that this is going to be like split in two. I, I imagine maybe like right here where there's this little dip between these two peaks, but I don't know. But this is where Christ is going to come. Um, over here is the Garden of Gethsemane and, and all that. If you look just a little bit over here uh, to the north, it's on the same, like, from what I gather, from what I've read, uh, this is all the same ridge, although this area right here is called the Mount of Olives, whereas over here, um, here so here's the BYU Jerusalem Center right there. So you can see, yeah, it's it's pretty prominent. You can you can see it with the naked eye, just like from right over here, um, right up against the Temple Mount. It's just like right there. It's right there. Mount of Olives, and then BYU Jerusalem Center, right there, right there. Um, I keep forgetting the name of the, yeah, Mount Scopius. Uh, we're gonna read up a little bit on Mount Scopius, but <clears throat> but basically it's on. Um, the western side of this ridge, which includes the Mount of Olives and Mount Scopius. Um, in fact, uh, well, well, we'll read it in just a minute, but the BYU Jerusalem Center is basically right in between the Mount of Olives and Mount Scopius. But um, 
technically it's on Mount Scopius. Okay, so kind of interesting that the church was able to um, not purchase because they don't own that land, but they were able to secure a lease uh, to rent the land and build the BYU Jerusalem Center right here. Okay, this is this is prime real estate. Like this entire area right here, this is prime real estate because uh, there's a lot of prophecy that involves uh, the Mount of Olives. And there's a lot of things that have occurred. This is where the atonement occurred. When, when Christ went to the Garden of Gethsemane, it was like over here. Um, in fact, I think that's what this um, church right here, I, I don't know if this is like a Greek Orthodox church, or, but I think that that is to commemorate um, the, the Garden of Gethsemane. I, I believe. I believe. I thought I heard something like that. But that's not the point of this video. So <clears throat> let's go back here. Okay, so you, you can see that, um, yeah, it would cause an uproar that the skyline of this prominent area is changed by uh, the BYU Jerusalem Center, right? Okay, so after several investigative committees of Israel's Neset uh, reviewed and debated the issue, Israeli officials decided to allow the center's construction to continue in 1986. The center opened to students in May 1988 and was dedicated by Howard W. Hunter on May 16th, 1989, which was a year later. <clears throat> and they did, they did that just to kind of keep a low profile and not make a big uh, deal out of it. Okay, before the center. Uh, the first LDS official to enter Jerusalem was Apostle Orson Hyde, an apostle who came in 1841 and dedicated, dedicated the land um, for the gathering of the people of Israel, the creation of a Jewish state, and the building of an LDS temple at some future time. Now, I would actually dispute this. Uh, the reason why, okay, it's saying here that um, part of his prayer was that we would build an LDS temple. Um, that's not actually what it says. Here I have the actual uh, prayer um, as it's recorded, and he, you know he wrote it down. Uh, it says right here, um, let's see, where does this sentence start? It's a long sentence, I guess. Now, O Lord, thy servant, <clears throat> now, now, O Lord, thy servant has been obedient to the heavenly vision which thou gavest him in his native land, and under the shadow of thine outstretched arm, he has safely arrived in this place to, de to dedicate and consecrate this land unto thee, for the gathering together of Judah's scattered remnants, according to the predictions of the holy prophets, uh, for the building up of Jerusalem again, after it has been trodden down by the Gentiles so long, and for rearing up a temple in honor of thy name. So he doesn't specifically say uh, a temple built by our church. So I, I would have a little bit of issue with this assertion right here. Um, I, I still think that it's very possible that the Jews may build the third temple and, then, and that will be the temple that Christ comes to. But uh, we're going to entertain this theory that it could be the BYU Jerusalem Center just for this video. Um, after his visit, LD, after his visit, LDS presence in the city was virtually non-existent. All right. Um, it was at this dedication that Kimball announced the church's intent. Okay, so this is when they're dedicating the Orson Hyde Memorial Gardens, uh, which is another spot that the, I guess the church, I don't know if they own it. Uh, I didn't look into that, but but there's a spot that comm commemorates Orson Hyde doing that dedication. <clears throat> so when they were dedicating the place where he dedicated <laughs> the land of Israel in Jerusalem, <clears throat> it was at this dedication that Kimball announced the church's intent to build a center for BYU students in the city. Now, that's interesting. Now, now you may you can view it one of two ways. Either President Kimball knew the actual purpose um, of the center that it was to ba basically be like a placeholder for a future temple, um, or you know, just like it, just like it looks like on the surface, um, they just wanted to build a. A facility there for BYU. So I guess you'll have to be the judge on that, and we can't really say either way for sure. But anyway, negoti negotiations between the church and the Israeli government stretched from 1980 to 1984. <clears throat> That's a long time, but 
I mean, what do I know? I don't have any experience with that. Um, the land the church wanted to, the church, the land the church wanted for the center, located at the northwestern margin of Mount Olivet, right next to the valley which separates it from Mount Scopus, had been occupied by Israel since the Six Day War in 1967 and could not be sold under Israeli law, so they weren't able to buy it. Um, the church decided to obtain a lease on the land instead. Leasing the land also prevented the politically controversial problem of the church owning a piece of Jerusalem land. Israeli officials saw the building of the center on the land as a way of solidifying control over land, over land whose ownership was ambiguous under international law. Okay, so they, they saw it as like a good move um, for their own goals. Uh, by August 1984, the church <clears throat> had the land on a 49-year lease. Uh, building permits had been obtained and construction on the building began. Uh, okay, now the land on which the center was built <clears throat> was still considered Arab land by many. And many officials saw it, saw that its lease would add an image of religious tolerance uh, to their government and increase Israeli control of the land. Because of the prominent location in the Jerusalem skyline, construction was quickly noticed, and this sparked a major con controversy in Israel and in the Jewish world as a whole beginning in 1985. The Haredim led the opposition, their main concern being that the building would be used not as a school, but as a center for Mormon proselyting efforts in Jerusalem. The Haredim warned of a spiritual holocaust. <laughs> really? Uh, the LDS church, they argued, had no <clears throat> local presence in the population of the Jerusalem area and no historical connections to the land. The, uh, the group spread warnings through letters, newspapers, and television in television that Mormon missionaries would convert Jews throughout the city, saying that, quote, the Mormon organization is one of the most dangerous. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, and in America, they have already struck down many Jews. Uh, at the present, the Mormons are cautious because of the tremendous opposition their missionary activities would engender. Uh, but the moment their new center is completed, we won't be able to stop them. That's uh, Cole Hayer. All right. Uh, warnings in the media led to street protests and demonstrations. Orthodox Jews marched in, on City Hall and to the construction site in 1986. Uh, some even gathered at the Western Wall in public prayer of mourning because of the center. So this really, this was really kind of a big deal for them at the time, but just, just for that small moment in time. Okay, a subcommittee of the Nesset and if you don't know, the Nesset, that's like their Congress. A subcommittee of the Nesset requested that LDS Church issue a formal promise not to pro proselytize Jews. Some Israelis considered this discriminatory, as no other Christian church had been asked to do this in Jerusalem. Church leaders, however, agreed to comply and sent a formally signed statement soon after. Some of the Jews in the area were still uneasy and doubted the church's intent, believing that religious belief among Mormons would supersede adherence to the law. One, pro one protester stated that converting the sons of Judah, us, is a basic article of their faith. They regard themselves as sons of Joseph and believe there will be no second coming for as long as we and they do not fuse. In addition to the promise not to proselyte, BYU began a public relations campaign to inform the public of their intentions for the center as a school and a gathering place for those already of the LDS faith. Ads were purchased in uh, local newspapers, magazines, and on television, and the center had per had personal appear, and this and the center had personnel appear on radio talk shows. Okay, so there was like a counter campaign, uh, like a PR campaign. Um, conducted by the church to ease everybody's fears. Uh, facilities and architecture. Okay, now th this is interesting, okay? This is interesting because let's take a look. Let's take a look at the BYU Center, okay? So this is inside. This is like the main, like, kind of like auditorium area. Now, if you've watched my previous videos about the new church symbol, okay, 
the new church symbol prominently features this arch, which President Nelson said uh, represents the tomb from which Christ came out when he was resurrected. Okay. Well, we, we've looked into this a little bit closer, and um, I think it has multiple meanings. I, I think, yes, it does uh, represent the tomb, uh, but I find it a little too coincidental that this right here, if you take this portion down here as well, the, the cornerstone portion of the symbol and the arch, this perfectly and proportionally matches the two front doors of the Salt Lake Temple. Perfectly. Perfectly. And then if you take off the bottom part, uh, this block, and you just have this portion right here, this perfectly matches up with the Golden Gate uh, that we talked about the um, over here on, on this like 360 view. That top part matches perfectly right here um, to, to this like the bottom of this like smaller doorway where this line is right here. So like right here, and up like this, up and around, this perfectly matches um, this portion of the church symbol. So, I, I like I've said in the previous video, I take that to mean that if they... First of all, I think it's too coincidental. I think possibly they were thinking about this. Um, but you have like the imagery of the resurrected Christ coming to the Salt Lake Temple, which... Right now, if he were to come right now, that's basically the center place of the church, or in other words, New Jerusalem, if there was one right now. And then, of course, uh, the Golden Gate, that's the entry into the Temple Mount, and uh, to where the temple will, will probably be if, if the Jews are successful in building their temple. So um, I found it interesting, as I started to research the BYU Jerusalem Center, that it features a lot of archways. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Here you have um, not only this main kind of like archway right here, but the organ itself <laughs> has like these like arches around um, these pipes right here. Okay, you look down this hallway, the entire thing uh, is an archway. Uh, you come outside, archways. Um, Interestingly, this is an interesting organ, by the way. Look at these uh, pipes right here. This was obviously done on purpose, and uh, it makes me—I don't know about—I don't know about you, but it makes me think of like trumpets, um, like angels' trumpets. But you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the intended um, kind of visual that they wanted and wanted you to think. But here you go. You know, here's another doorway, another arched doorway. Um, you look over here, arch, 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 arches all over the place. Um, when you look at the Salt Lake Temple, so first let's come back here. So when you're when you're looking at the BYU Jerusalem Center from the outside, um, that's what you're going to notice. It's just like all these arches, arch, 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 all all around it. Okay. When you look at the Salt Lake Temple, and I've shown you this before, it also just all over the whole thing. It's just arches, arch, 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 door, door, window, 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 window. Um, you come over here, you look at the side view of the temple, arch, 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 arch. It's just arches all over the place, uh, including inside the temple, the doorways and, and such. And I've, I've shown that before. So it's interesting, it's interesting that if the Salt Lake Temple is the temple that Christ will come to um, initially, right? Because I have the theory that, yeah, he could maybe come to Salt Lake, and this is the temple that he will come to, to the to the temporary New Jerusalem. Um, and then later, maybe we'll build up Jerusalem where I think it's supposed to be, in Jackson County. But um, So if, if, if the Salt Lake Temple is the temple that he comes to, and then if he comes to the BYU Jerusalem Center, uh, after being dedicated as a temple, you have these two temples that have just like all these arches. They're they're very similar um, as far as that goes, like in terms of how many arches they have. Um, so that could be just like a superficial coincidence, but um, I, I tend not to think so. Now, I can tell you right now, and, and I did it before I started this video, the church logo does not match uh, these arches. These arches are too wide. Um, 
compared to the to the church symbol. So, but I still think it's significant that it has all these arches. Now we're about to read why because um, it, it it talks here about the uh, architecture and everything. Okay. Facilities and architecture. The center was designed in partnership with Frank Ferguson of FFKR Architects, Salt Lake City, and by Brazilian-Israeli architect David Resnick, who also designed the nearby campus of Hebrew University. The center is situated on the western slope of the Mount of Olives, uh, right where it connects with Mount Scopius, which I, I think that's kind of interesting. I, I don't know why. Just because it like connects to mountains, but okay. Um, overlooking the Kidron Valley and the Old City. The 125,000 square foot, eight level structure, eight levels, that's crazy, is uh, set amid five acres of gardens. The first five levels provide a dormitory and apartment space for up to 170 students. Each of these apartments have a patio. That's nice. Uh, I wish I could stay there overlooking the old city. The sixth level houses a cafeteria, classrooms, computer facilities, and gymnasium, uh, while administrative and, and faculty offices are located on the seventh level, along with a 250, 250 seat auditorium. The main entry is on the eighth level, uh, which also contains a recital and special events auditorium with organ. And it looks like that's what we were looking at. That's, I guess that's the um, eighth level. Uh, lecture rooms, general and reserve libraries, offices, a domed theater, of course it's domed, um, and a learning resource area. The auditorium is surrounded by glass on three sides, uh, providing views of the city. Okay, um, <clears throat> the center's design reflects the architecture of, of the Near East. So that's why it looks the way it does. Um, it is constructed of cast concrete, hand-carved Jerusalem limestone adorning the building according to lo local custom. The use of arches and domes closely models other building of Jerusalem, other building of Jerusalem and the gardens throughout the center contain many trees and other plants named in the Bible. The interior contains the arches and uh, cupola, cu cupola, cupola, cu cupolas, 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 uh, typical of the Near East, and large windowed pavilions provide wide, wide views of Jerusalem. Over 400 micropiles were drilled into, into the mountain to secure the foundation in case of an earthquake, right? Uh, weren't we just talking about that earlier, how we know that there's going to be a massive earthquake when Christ comes to Jerusalem. So, interesting. That's interesting. Uh, okay, mission. Members of the church of members of the LDS Church believe that Jesus Christ will return in glory uh, in His second coming. Howard W. Hunter, who was president of the church's Quorum of the Twelve at the time of the center's construction, pointed out that although there would be no proselytizing from the center. Uh, it still served a valuable purpose. One church member quoted him this way, quote, Elder Hunter said that our mission was not to harvest, probably not even to plant, uh, but to clear away a few more stones, uh, end quote. Latter-day Saints often see the center as a way for them to show local Jews what the church is about, by example, rather than proselyting. This is done by the way students and faculty at the center live their lives, as well as through the hiring of both Israeli and Palestinian workers as an example of what can be done through cooperation. During construction of the center, for example, the church hired as many as 300 workers at one time, with about 60% of them being Arab and the other 40% being Jewish. Similar cooperation continues today. So, <clears throat> knowing that they wouldn't be able to proselyte um, and, you know, quote unquote, couldn't even really uh, plant any seeds, um, they still felt that it was worth it to build this center. And for, for BYU, uh, right, in, in this very prominent location of Jerusalem, um, a really important, important or kind of like a very um, visible spot within the skyline of, uh, of those mountains over there. Uh, 
you know, but just just as a campus, just for BYU, just so that students could come here and uh, learn a little bit more about n n Near Eastern studies and so forth, just to, you know, further their education and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know about that. Um, OK, so we went through that, that. OK, about the center. Uh, on Mount Scopus, adjacent to the Mount of Olives, and overlooking the Old City, the Kidron Valley, and the Holy Mount, the Brigham Young University Jerusalem Center, or for Near Eastern Studies, known as the Mormon University locally, has become a major landmark in this ancient and historic city. Uh, administrative and faculty offices are located on the seventh level. Oh, I, didn't, I don't need to read that. Um, here's some more pictures. <clears throat> So let's just look through this really quick. So here's the exterior again. And man, yeah, that really, that really, really stands out. It really does. Now up here, I mean, it doesn't look like it's a perfect cube, but another thought that I had was that um, you had, where, where did I, right here. Uh, you had the second temple that, uh, was essentially a cube, or at least the, the sanctuary or, or the Holy of Holies. Um, it's always been a cube, right? So I don't know um, if they intended for that for the BYU Jerusalem Center. I mean, it's not as big, it's not as prominent, but it does look kind of cube-like like up here. And you'll notice that um, this uh, highest kind of like level right here, this highest block, whatever you want to call it, it's it's off center. It seems like it's closer to the north side um, of the center rather than to the southern side. So it does kind of seem a little bit like temple-like. Like if you were to, um, okay, if we go back here, you see how the cube or the sanctuary, uh, the main part of the temple, it's more um, to this side than it is to this side. And that's how the temple, the, the ancient temples always were, right? Here's like another, let's look at this view. You see that right there? So I didn't do this, but it'd be interesting to like compare the proportions like this right here uh to ground level and then from here to here and how close this is to this extreme and how far away it is from this uh entrance over here but it, it's kind of it's kind of similar don't you think it's kind of similar a bit anyway that that might be a video for another time but that, that's one thought that i had but let's let's continue on here uh well, another thing. Now, th now this is interesting. This just came to me just now. Okay, so this is the face of the BYU Jerusalem Center right here. This is like the the, the kind of like um, the front, I guess you could say. Like you, you basically look out this way. So if you're inside, you're looking through these windows over here uh, to the old city and to the, the Temple Mount and so forth. But the entrance, I think the entrance is over here on the south, I believe. I could be wrong about that. But but if it is, if I'm right, that's interesting because that's pointing south to the Mount of Olives, which would be over here. So if Christ comes down to the Mount of Olives, um, and then if later, if they end up, him and the Jews, if they end up coming over here to the temple, this would be the entryway. Because uh, typically... You know, a temple like right here, this is facing east. This is facing east toward the Mount of Olives, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's look at it this way. Um, so in this picture, again, this is the east side. Over there is the west side. And the Mount of Olives would be down here. So this is facing east. Um, and if the BYU Jerusalem Center is similar, if it's kind of like patterned, after um, the second temple, this is facing south to where he would come. So that's kind of interesting, I think. You know, I, th I think that that might be a little too coincidental. Um, let's continue on. Let's keep looking. So here, here's like that um, area. And here there's a fountain. 
and some pretty pretty crazy looking uh, some pretty crazy looking doors right here. <laughs> it's kind of cool. This right here doesn't this look temple like to you? Like if you didn't know any better, uh, maybe if this like uh, artwork or whatever this is wasn't right there, and someone told you that this was a temple. Uh, and you didn't know what temple it was, uh, you'd probably believe him, right? Doesn't this look like a temple to you? It does to me. Out here, this is a is this a millstone? I think that's what they call it for like crushing things. Uh, this was probably I, I'm gonna guess that this is for making olive oil, but I, I'm not sure about that. Oh, and, and this is a press. No, is this this maybe both of those are made for or used for making olive oil? I don't know. Like you crush it and then it spills down here and then it um, pours through this like crack right here. Okay, more of the inside. Here's that uh, auditorium and as you can see it's looking um, westward onto the old city. Here's uh, some room, maybe a computer lab. Well, no, not right now. Well, I don't know what this is, okay? I don't know. Uh, library. Okay, I, I can I can safely say this is probably the library, uh, and maybe a computer lab at the same time. Another outside shot. Uh, again, uh, if you didn't know any better, <clears throat> if you were just like right here and you couldn't see like all the way up here, you might mistakenly think if you didn't if you couldn't see the city roundabout, you might mistakenly think that this is um, a temple. Well, with the exception of like these windows right here, because temple windows are never like. 100% um, or like they're, they're they're always opaque right um, so that you can't really see in or it's stained glass so yeah I guess that would give it away but if, if that wasn't an issue you might think that this is possibly a temple okay the sign okay now we're back to the original image okay let's move on so I, I think this right here I think that that's the main entrance I, I could be wrong though because i don't know maybe that that doesn't really look like a door but if they remodeled and maybe that's their intention in the future because like if, to make this like a temple um, i'm sure there'd be, have to be extensive remodeling done inside but if i'm right and if this right here looks uh southward and then if they turn this into the entrance like the main entrance then that that's that would be interesting because that would be the the direction from which Christ would enter into the temple. Okay. That, that, here's some 360s, but we already kind of, we looked at this already. Church symbol. Looked at the Salt Lake Temple. Okay, let's read a little bit about Mount Scopius. Um, there's some interesting stuff here. So in Hebrew, it means Mount of the Watchmen. Mount of the Watchmen sentinels and then over here in arabic mount lookout or mount of the scene slash burial site i guess okay so that's interesting because when we're talking about watchmen in um in the scriptures we're typically talking about the prophets right they're they're the watchmen on the tower um so that already is pretty fascinating <laughs> That that's where the BYU Jerusalem Center is located. Uh, between the 1948 Arab-Israeli War and the Six-Day War in 1967, the, pe the peak of Mount Scopius with the Hebrew University campus and Hadassah Hospital was a UN-protected Israeli enclave uh, or, on, or exclave, exclave within Jordanian administrative territory. Today, Mount Scopius lies between the municip municipal boundaries, uh, within the municipal boundaries of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so it's actually in Jerusalem itself. Uh, antiquity. Overlooking Jerusalem, Mount Scopius has been, been strategically important as a base from which to attack the city since antiquity. <laughs> More interesting stuff. Um, modern era. It is described as being the northeastern part of the ridge that predom that prominently includes the Mount of Olive, Olives, which dominates Jerusalem from the east. So it's like it's part of the same ridge. That that's what I was talking about earlier. 
uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Construction of the of the Mount Scopius campus of the Hebrew University began in 1918 on land purchased from the Gray Hill Estate. The dedication ceremony was held in 1925 in the presence of many dignitaries. So this university, uh, they were there for a long time. Now that could be one reason why this site was located because it was already kind of like um, a place of education, right? Because the BYU uh, Jerusalem Center isn't too far, as you can see right here, Here's uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem right here, and over here is BYU. Um, so maybe that made it easier to to secure this piece of land because it's kind of like I, I don't know like if Jerusalem is zoned into like you know industrial, residential, uh, commercial areas, stuff like that. But whatever the case, that might be why this was selected. But it also might be one of those miracles because. Uh, the Lord may have made it this way so that BYU could be built here uh, later on after this was constructed. Okay. Um, Ammunition Hill. Ammunition Hill was a fortified Jordanian military post on the northwest side of Mount Scopius in Jerusalem. That was in the northern part of Jordanian East Jerusalem. It was the site of one of the fiercest battles of the Six-Day War. So... This location, uh, very interesting, very interesting that B the BYU Jerusalem Center is on, basically on a technically on a mount called uh, Mount Scopius, which means Watchmen and um, Outlook. It, what, what was it all said up here? It said Watchmen, Sentinels, and Mount Lookout. You know, and then not only that, but it's kind of like it's basically between that mountain and the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> I wish this uh, satellite image was better, but it's not. But anyway, um, so here, see, this is what I'm talking about. So here's the Mount of Olives right here. Uh, here it is, like, right here. So, like, it seems like it faces this way, this way, uh, as far as, like, where that entrance would be. Um, okay, let's go over here. Uh, municipal laws in Jerusalem require that all bu buildings be faced with locally sourced limestone, uh, which can be seen on, on the building's exterior, gardens, and courtyards. One of the best views can be had from the chapel, which uh, looks over the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, and the Old City. So that's just an interesting detail. It has to all be limestone. Um, now this is basically how it's viewed. Yeah, see right here, here's like another picture of it. Um, again, I don't know if there's like an entrance right there, but, uh, it could be made into an entrance at a future date if it's not right now. If you've been to, to the BYU Jerusalem Center, then, uh, please put your, your thoughts in the comments below and, uh, correct anything that I get wrong. Okay, about the center, a beautiful building. Now, I'm about to get into some into some pretty incredible stuff after this, so just hang in there. Um, the BYU Jerusalem Center is a beautiful building on Mount Scopius over, overlooking the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, and the Old City. Uh, okay, we've already read that. Okay, I didn't need to. Okay, now this, <clears throat> this is like one of the miracles that made this possible. When you think about this miracle... You have to wonder if the Lord's plans was simply to have this happen so that we could build a campus in Jerusalem, or if this was supposed to happen so that one day we could have a temple, an LDS temple in Jerusalem. Okay, check this out. This is incredible. If you don't, if you have not heard this story, this is going to blow your mind. Okay, <clears throat> Elder John Alexander Clark was born. February 29, 1871, the fifth child in a family of 10. Uh, to, to Ezra Thompson Clark and Susan Leggett Clark in Farmington, Utah. Okay, by the time he was 23, he was teaching school in Minersville, Utah, but he felt impressed that he needed to serve a mission. When his mission call finally came, he was surprised to read, a, read that he would be serving in Palestine. 
So back then, I, I we were able to do that. <laughs> okay, this was before the state of Israel was created. His parents were worried about his being called to serve in such a remote part of the world and begged him not to go. But John firmly believed that the Lord had a special purpose in sending him to the Holy Land, and he was determined to serve where he was called by the Lord. When he arrived in the Turkey mission via England and Germany, he was eventually assigned by his mission president to work in Haifa, uh, about an hour north of Jerusalem. Okay, now we're going to skip down here. Unfortunately, Elder Clark soon after entered a home where the family members were sick with a contagious disease and he contracted smallpox. He died several days later at the age of 24 in Palestine. Because of the dreaded nature of the disease, he was quickly buried in a cemetery at the base of Mount Carmel, Palestine, and his personal belongings burned. <sighs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so pretty extreme um, happening there. Eld Elder Clark's death was a great shock to the members of his family. He died, he died while working in the Muslim area of Haifa, Palestine. Up until his death, Elder Clark was cared for by brother and sister uh, Hild and other kind friends. Interestingly, in the tithing records <clears throat> that the Haifa branch, uh, that the Haifa branch at the at the time, there is a record giving Elder Clark credit for paying 10 francs of tithing on January 18th, 1895. Still later, on January 26th, his name appears again as a tithe payer uh, just 13 days before his death. Sadly, just three years later, Elder Adolf Hogg of Stuart, Germany, died August 3rd, 1892. So, we have... We have these two missionaries uh, that die in Palestine, okay? Two missionaries that die in Palestine, uh, and he died of typhus. Elder Hogg was also buried in Haifa, Palestine, now Israel. The two graves of these missionaries are located near each other in the same cemetery, okay? Other than beloved family members, most members of the church would probably not know of Elder John Alexander Clark and Elder Adolf Hogg. But for, some in, but, but for some interesting developments which occurred in the Holy Land in the mid-1970s. Okay, this is where it gets quite interesting. David B. Galbraith, a BYU professor, was appointed in 1972 as the resident director of BYU's study abroad program in Israel. He was also called that same year to serve as the first branch president of the church in Jerusalem. In these assignments, he oversaw the experience of thousands of students who came to the Holy Land through BYU. In the mid-1970s, the church determined that it should, seek, it should seek formal recognition by the government of Israel as a church legal entity uh, with certain legal rights, including the right to be a landowner and to have certain banking privileges <clears throat> uh, to deal with large sums of money. The church was interested in, in acquiring some land for the construction of the BYU Jerusalem Center and needed to obtain this formal recognition. There were only five non-Jewish religions uh, that were recognized in Israel at the time. The Roman Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, Armani, uh, Baha'i, and the Anglican Church. These entities were, of course, not interested in having a new upstart Christian religion, particularly, particularly one from America, working their way into this elite group. The Baptists and others had already tried and failed previously. The church's local attorney in Israel explained that the church would likely never attain the status of the original five, whose presence predated the state of Israel, unless the church could somehow or could show a similar official presence existing in the Holy Land dating back before Israel's establishment in the year 1948. The church's efforts to construct construct a, a building for Near Eastern Studies in the Holy Land were met with great resistance, and we, we read all about that. The Jewish leaders argued that the LDS Church should not be allowed to construct a building on the selected site when it had never had a presence in the Holy Land previously. It seemed as if nobody wanted the church to be established in Jerusalem. But then an important miracle occurred. It was discovered that the two Mormon missionaries were buried in a cemetery in Haifa. 
they had died while establishing the LDS Church in the Holy Land some 90 years earlier, in 1892 and 1895, respectively. The inscription on Elder Clark's headstone made it very clear uh, who he represented. Quote, uh, in, in fond remembrance of John A. Clark, son of Ezra and Susanna Clark, born February 28, 1871, at Farmington, Utah, USA, died February 8, 1895, at Haifa, Palestine, a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, end quote. Elder Hogg's inscription on his nearby head tombstone <clears throat> said essentially the same thing in German. Although there was there had been no, although there had also been a mission home in Haifa before uh, the establishment of the state of Israel, the real property records did not indicate that it had been purchased outright by the church. Professor David Galbraith uh, points out in his article entitled "The Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies: Reflections of a Mormon Pioneer," the Religious Educator, Volume Nine, Number One, Two Thousand Eight, quote. Even though the street and the very building could be located, there was no evidence of any documents that the church had owned the, the land outright, end quote. Nevertheless, based significantly on the fact that the church's two missionaries' headstones confirmed the existence of the church in the Holy Land in the 1890s, the Articles of Association sailed right through the complex approval process without complication. <laughs> That's a miracle. Although the church did not acquire the same exact legal statuses as the original five churches, the church had miraculously satisfied the requirements of Israeli law for a modern association as a legal entity. This meant that it had all the, all the legal rights associated under Israel law, which included the right to own land and conduct business or conduct banking business. The Articles of Association were approved on June 16th, 1977. There's a 7-7 seven, seven right there. Um, later, another Israeli attorney, Joseph Kokia, was retained to successfully guide BYU through the same political minefield in establishing its own legal status in Israel. Okay, so, so the university itself, um, not just the church. It now became clear that one of the important purposes of the Lord in sending these two young men on missions to Palestine was to assist in establishing the church in the Holy Land a century later. They did not die in vain. I remember hearing this the first time when I was in Institute uh, back at um, in Salt Lake Community College uh, a while ago. <laughs> this was a while ago. But I remember the, the Institute teacher um, telling this story and he was very excited about it. Uh, he was blown away. I was blown away. Um, again, I, I submit to you. Do you think that the Lord would have those two missionaries give up their lives simply so that BYU could have a campus in Jerusalem? Now, I'm not going to say for sure that this is going to become a temple or be the temple that Christ is going to come to. Um, but it's pretty clear, I, I would think, that it is a special building. It has a special purpose, a very special purpose, beyond just being the BYU Jerusalem Center. Now, you could say, well, it's important that it's there because you have all these um, Jewish people and Arabs that work there, and so they kind of come in contact with the church, and maybe, you know, over the process of time, maybe the church will kind of uh, grow because of that. Uh, I, I don't, maybe, maybe. Uh, I find that a little bit doubtful, but um, it could be. It could be. Um, could this be a building of some other kind of significance? Uh, yeah, it could be. But... Again, if you if you take it all together, right, the the layout of the building, just the, the way that it's oriented and stuff like that, um, all the arches, which you know that's maybe just a superficial thing, but I think it, it is kind of significant. Um, the way it looks inside, um, all the money that's gone into the into it, all the all the work that's gone into it, uh, I feel like there's a lot more going on here than just another campus for Near Eastern Studies. 
that's just me. Uh, there's more. There's more. Um, now, this is just anecdotal evidence. I don't know who this is, but I'm just throwing this in just to, for consideration. I don't know. This is October 15th, 2010. Uh, the Mormon Folklore Project. I don't know what that is. Um, more, okay, more stories from my friend Um Samwile, who lived in the Middle East. There are rumors that the church owns land in Dubai on which to build the temple. Uh, yeah, and that turned out to be true. <laughs> this is back in 2010. Uh, we're going to be having this temple in uh, Dubai. Um, similar rumors abound that the BYU Jerusalem Center is architecturally laid out like a temple. Um, and I don't know if that's referring to like the inside um, or what I kind of already noted about how it, it kind of like resembles uh, the original temples in Jerusalem. But um, anyway, and that one would just need to move some chairs around and dedicate it for it to become a fully functioning temple. I asked one of my Arabic professors about this and he denied it, but he had a really shifty look on his face that made me think that he knew something but couldn't reveal too much. Okay, so you have to take this one uh, with a grain of salt, obviously. Uh, coming from a place called the Mormon Folklore Project, and then by Ted in 2010. Don't even know his last name. Um, but that's, I'll leave that there for your consideration. Uh, okay, check this out. There, there's more. Elder Holland gives an inside look to miracles that made the BYU Jerusalem Center possible. possible. So, miracles, plural. This came out 2019. Okay, Provo, Utah, at 6:45 a.m. on November 14th, 18. Oh my gosh, 1985. Uh, President Gordon B. Hinckley, chairman of the executive committee committee of the BYU Board of Trustees, received an urgent phone call from then from then BYU President Jeffrey R. Holland. President Holland had just received a series of phone calls through the night about trouble in Jerusalem regarding the construction of the BYU Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies. Tensions were high in Israel for a variety of reasons, and talk of war was in the air. Politically, there was a 60-60 deadlock between two halves of a coalition in the Neset, uh, the Israeli parliament. A small political party uh, had said it was willing to break the deadlock by giving its four votes in parliament to either competing prime minister and party who would move Mormons off Mount Scopus. Off Mount Scopus. Um, it was a full year after the construction of the BYU Jerusalem Center had started. President Holland knew the very controversial center could be a factor in uh, bringing down the tenuous Israeli government. Uh, President Holland explained the situation to President Hinckley and desperately asked, uh, what do you? What do we do if we are a factor in in an Israeli war with its neighbors? <laughs> this is not a situation you want to encounter uh, in a job like that. President Hinckley took the issue to the temple, meeting with the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in in the Salt Lake Temple later that morning. Following the discussion that ensued, President Ezra Taft Benson, the church's 13th president, who had not was not physically strong at the time, asked if he could be the voice of the prayer for that day. Uh, though President Holland was not in attendance in the temple meeting, he said some of the brethren described President Benson as, quote, praying at length with increasing strength. By the end, he was declaring he wasn't praying as much as he was testifying. President Hinckley called President Holland after the meeting and said they had done all they could. Uh, they were to wait and see what would happen. Yikes. Uh, <clears throat> then a miracle occurred. Okay, a miracle. One party offered an apology to the other. Political forgiveness was granted. The offer of swing votes was declined. And tensions in the Neset were eased for the time being. Uh Many, many commented that a political miracle had, had happened, recounted Elder Holland, now a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. 
I also say a miracle happened, but it wasn't technically a political one, and it didn't come from Jerusalem. It didn't come from London. It didn't come from Washington, D.C. or New York City. The miracle that morning came from the fourth floor of the Salt Lake Temple, where a prophet, seer, and revelator prayed uh, prayed safety and protection down upon something the Lord wanted done in that land. Again, do you think that what the Lord wanted done in that land was just for BYU students to go and study? Maybe. Probably not. Um, this was one of 33 miracles. That was one of 33 miracles, large or small, that happened to make the BYU Jerusalem Center possible, Elder Holland said during the 30th anniversary of the dedication on October 11th. Former students and faculty who attended the Jerusalem Center were present at the event, which was held on the campus of BYU in Provo, Utah. Explaining some of the pivotal moments in the history of uh, the BYU Jerusalem Center, Elder Holland began by telling of President Harold B. Lee's visit to Jerusalem in September 1972, uh, around the time of the High Holy Days, by the way, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the first visit to the Holy Land by a prophet in nearly 2,000 years. He then spoke of President N. Eldon Tanner's mandate in 1979 to acquire what seemed to be an impossible property on Mount Scopus. Now, again, I have been unable to find out why they wanted it there. Like, I, I can't, I can't like trace it down um, to any article or do document. So, I don't know if it just has to do with the fact that Hebrew University is up there, that they have a campus up there. I don't know if they like specifically wanted like something that's on the Mount of Olives and then that's the closest that they could get. I, I don't know. But you have to you have to ask that question, right? The location where the BYU Jerusalem Center currently stands overlooking the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, and the Old City. Um, while the church was successful in acquiring the land and building in a building permit, every possible opponent came out against the project over the next several years, Elder Holland said. One such battle occurred when the Israeli government required a non-proselytizing agreement to continue construction. During a special meeting on July 31st, 1985, the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles counseled on how to move forward. One of the brethren read from Mormon 316, noting that earlier prophets had been forbidden to preach the gospel and asking if the church was again willing to stand as an idle witness in Jerusalem. I want to read that really quick. If it'll come up. Okay, Mormon 316. 316. And it came to pass that I utterly refused to go up against mine enemies, and I, I did even as the Lord had commanded me, and I did stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which I saw and heard, according to the manifestations of the Spirit which had testified of these things to, of, of things to come. Okay, so that's this was the scripture that gave them the inspiration. Okay. Let's go back. Um, it seemed to be a message from heaven itself, Elder Holland said, and the brethren signed the agreement. All students, travel visitors, and local members have, have loyally abided by its non-proselytizing restrictions for more than 30 years. This encounter started a campaign of round-the-clock interview requests with media outlets from Israel, Europe, uh, the United States, and elsewhere. In light of this extensive international coverage of his peacekeeping visit to Jerusalem, Elder Holland said he worked nonstop to turn the tide and make it clear to everyone that neither the church nor the university was building a missionary center. The Israeli government ruled in 1986 that BYU was within legal rights to build the center and construction continued. The BYU Jerusalem Center was dedicated May 16, uh, 1989, by Elder Howard W. Hunter, later to be the 14th president of the church. Okay, at the, now this is cool too. At the end of his address, Elder Holland emphasized four of the many lessons he learned from the miracles of the BYU Jerusalem Center. And I don't use the word miracle lightly, he said. 
These are these are strong words, you guys. This this is no ordinary building. This is no ordinary building. Okay, one. The Lord can do his own work. He would like us to help. Uh, very often he needs us to help, but I can testify in this case and many others, the Lord can do his own work. He didn't <clears throat> he did his own work there. People were okay, number two, people were in the right place at the right time to bring about this large miracle. It's not the glass or teak wood or stone I think I, I think about the most when I think of the Jerusalem Center. It is the people then and now, there and here, who through their faith and good works made it happen. That is what I think about when I consider this special place. Three, in the work in the work of the Lord, <clears throat> okay, in the work of the Lord, press forward with courage. Uh, when you start something in the great cause of the kingdom, don't stop voluntarily. Uh, we were moving dirt in August 1984, but we were acting on sheer faith because we did not yet have a clear green light to do so. If we had not started in faith and persisted while we prayed, we would not be at the center today. Okay, number four. The full potential of the... Okay, this is like... This is my favorite one. And this one is almost kind of telling, I, I think. The full potential of the BYU Jerusalem Center is still unrealized. What, what does he mean by that? Now, if he means in an academic sense, um, I, I don't know. Does he mean like adding more classes, having more students go visit? Um, what, what does he mean? The full potential of the BYU Jerusalem Center is still unrealized. Quote, I don't know what it will mean a generation after we're gone or what future purposes the Lord will have for it, but I hope students from all over the world can be blessed by it. My testimony to you is that the Lord wanted that center built and has it there for great purposes that we now see only dimly. Wow, that is a loaded statement. That is a loaded statement. T take that in. Take that in as we think about if this could potentially be uh, the temple of Jerusalem. <laughs> Let me read it again. The full potential of the BYU Jerusalem Center is still unrealized. I don't know what it will mean a generation after we're gone. Uh, and we know that we're really close to the second coming, don't we? Or what future purpose the Lord will have for it. But I hope students from all over the world can be blessed by it. My testimony. Th this is his testimony. My testimony to you is that the Lord wanted that center built. And has it there for a great purpose. For great purposes that we now see only dimly. That is simply amazing to me. Um, let's see. I don't think that there was really anything else here. So uh, I'll leave it to you. Think about it. You know, do you think that this is a possibility? Is it possible that water could flow out from under this temple, maybe at the base of the mountain or in some sense? Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, is there any reason why the temple would have to be built on the Temple Mount? Well, according to Jews, yes, it has to be built there because they view it as like, um, like inherently a holy site, right? In fact, a lot of them uh, warn against going up to the Temple Mount or, or careful where you walk because you could be walking where the Holy of Holies was and uh, violating the sanctuary but that but that's them okay that that's part of their beliefs and uh i don't know they could be right but we also know <clears throat> from modern revelation that that's not the only temple that can be built we've built temples all over the world all over including united arab emirates including hong kong <laughs> including apparently in India. And then 
just all over the world. So we know that temples don't necessarily have, like, there, well, we know that there can be multiple temples. We're doing it. We're doing it right now. There's over 200 temples. So we know that um, you can, now, there are places, it would seem, that temples were meant to be built, including the Salt Lake Temple, right? Because uh, President Brigham Young, he he's famous for saying, you know, this is the place, and uh, I think putting his, his cane or whatever on the spot where the temple was to be constructed. So it, it does seem like there's certain places where temples should be built, specifically, and maybe another one of those is uh, the future temple in um, Jackson County, uh, where Joseph Smith, he dedicated the site and the, I guess, I think it was the cornerstone. Um, so yeah, th I think there are some places where temples are supposed to be built. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I think that temples are, the church tries to build temples in beautiful areas that are prominent, where many people can see it and become interested by it. Um, but as far as this particular temple in Jerusalem, does it have to be built on the Temple Mount? There, there's nothing that I'm aware of in our scriptures that say that it has to be built on the Temple Mount. Okay. Um, I would even be led to believe, if I if I was to listen to Orson Pratt, was it Orson Pratt? Yeah, Orson Pratt and Bruce R. McConkie that it has to be built by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's something that they said. I don't know if that was just their opinion. Um, Orson Pratt, that was like in the early days of the church, so maybe that wasn't quite ironed out. But when you take those two statements, and, it, and if they're right, then here you go. This very well may become that future temple right here. We might be looking at it. Um, now, if it is supposed to be built up by the Jews, then uh, it looks like we're going to have to wait for the third temple to be built on the Temple Mount. Um, or if they build it in some other location. You know, there's theories that the City of David, which is like a little area to the, to the south of the Temple Mount, just like immediately south, um, <clears throat> there's some that believe that that's the actual location where the, the Temple was. But whatever the case, um, it's going to happen. And ju just like Bruce Ar or just like um, Elder Holland said, the Lord can do His own work. He He does work through us, but He can also do His own work. So, whatever the case, whether this is supposed to become the new temple, or whether there's supposed to be one built exactly on the Temple Mount where it was before, the Lord will make it happen, one way or another. But I find this very interesting. I think it's very possible, and this would. Uh, certainly speed things up, wouldn't it? As far as like, oh, Christ, you know, Christ can't come, the, the second coming can't happen until the temple's built in Jerusalem. Well, if this is it, then check. All it has to do is maybe be remodeled uh, inside and then be dedicated. And I'm sure that that wouldn't take too long to do. All right, I'm going to leave it there. Um, make sure to share this uh, with others. There may be some that aren't familiar with uh, the details of the Jerusalem Center, the miracles that, is, that are associated with it. Uh, so make sure to, sure to share this. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Hit the notification bell. Leave your comments, and especially if you have comments with sources for information to look up. Uh, rather than just saying, no, you're wrong. Uh, leave sources, please, for why I'm wrong. And I'll talk to you guys later.